the love of the Father, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ that passes all understanding, the joy of the Lord that the Spirit of God gives, may it be unto you this day, for to you to be God Almighty, revealed to you in His Word, in His love, in His life, and in His way. I pray you may see Jesus today, and that you might hear from Him speaking to you as you listen to God speak and reveal to you Jesus. Colossians. Tonight we're in chapter 1. Tonight God is going to address you. He's going to speak to you. He's going to do as he said this morning as we looked at Colossians and reveal to you how you are chosen. He's going to reveal how you are meant to be and God is causing you to be faithful. He is going to uncover for you the revelation of what he's done in order to make you faithful brother and faithful sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know how he's going to do that? By his love. Colossians. This letter is from Paul, chosen by God, to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. It is written to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Jesus. May God our Father give you grace and peace. We always pray for you and we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard you trust in Christ Jesus, and that you love all of God's people. You do this because you are looking forward to the joys of heaven, as you have been ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out to all over the world. It is changing lives everywhere just as it changed your life that you first heard the day you heard it and understood the truth about God's great loving kindness to sinners. Epaphras, our much loved co-worker, was the one who brought to you the good news. He is Jesus' faithful servant and he is helping us in your place. He is the one who told us about the great love for others that the Holy Spirit has given unto you. So we have continued praying for you ever since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you a complete understanding of what He wants to do in your lives. And we ask Him to make you wise with spiritual wisdom. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and you will continually do good, kind things for others. All the while you will learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with His glorious power so that you will have all the patience and endurance you need. May you be filled with joy. Always thanking the Father who has enabled us to share the inheritance that belongs to God's holy people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness. And he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. God has purchased our freedom with his blood. And he has forgiven all our sins. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God and existed before God made anything at all and is supreme over all creation. He is God. 
Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Kings, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. Everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before anything else began, and he holds all creation together. Jesus is the head of the church. It is his body. He is the first of all who will rise from the dead, for he has risen from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ Jesus. And by him, God reconciled everything and everyone to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and everything on earth by means of his blood on the cross. This includes you who were once so far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, yet now, he has brought you back as his friends. He has done this through his death on the cross in his own human body. As a result, he has brought you into the very presence of God and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand in it firmly. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed by God to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am completing what remains of Christ's suffering for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his message in all its fullness to you Gentiles. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to his own holy people. For it has pleased God to tell his people that the riches and glory of Jesus are for the Gentiles too. For this is the secret. Jesus lives in you, and this is your assurance that you will share in his glory. So everywhere we go, everything we do, we tell everyone about Jesus. We warn them, we teach them, and with all wisdom God has given us, we want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Jesus. I work very hard at this as I depend on Jesus' mighty power that works within me. Father, I thank you that it is by your love forever and ever enduring throughout eternity that has reached out to us and saved us from ourselves. God, such love is too wonderful to behold, too magnificent to comprehend, too awesome to be anything except but experienced and appreciated for what it is, your grace. Oh God, how amazing it is that you should volunteer to die for me. Heal me, hear me, and forgive me. Cleanse me from all my unrighteousness and wickedness so that I may appreciate and be made perfect, complete in you by the power of your Holy Spirit to reveal to these good people the good news that you have done everything that is required of the law and you have completed the work of everything that God would have chosen to do to reconcile me and everyone that hears me and sees these words and reads them to himself. God has brought us back to himself, and we have found salvation and relationship with him. God, by your spirit, causes us to be ever so much more so in love with him than we ever were before. And oh God, our God, Father, reveal Jesus to us. I could sing of his love forever, but let's look at his word today. And let us examine what it is that God might say to us so that we could not try to work harder or to add anything to the work that has already been done for us, but that we might work out from within the salvation that God has purchased for us, that we might live a more complete and perfect life with him 
as we choose to live in Him, as He comes to abide with us, as He lives inside us. And so, in verse 1, this letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. It is written to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God our Father give you grace and peace. You know, God's holy people really are everywhere and anywhere that you find Jesus. If you find a people that have grace and peace, you usually find Jesus in the midst of them, somewhere, somehow. And it wasn't God's holy people that he's talking to about the Jews. He's talking about you, and he's talking about me. He's talking about those who have apprehended and been caught up by this good news that's been proclaimed, that someone, somewhere, at some point in time, much like Paul and Timothy, have gone forth and proclaimed the good news. Hey, you can have that which God has done for you, salvation from your sins. You can have this great exaltation of the realization of knowing God personally where other people will talk about God distantly but you can know Jesus intimately because that is the good news we proclaim to you that by his spirit you can be one with God and forgiven that in the name of the son you can have the same spirit that God has given to his son that you could see God that you could hear God, that you could know God, that you could have a personal relationship with Jesus. And this is the good news you've received. And so we find that is what God's holy people are. Those that have received the good news and are living according to grace and peace. So in verse 5, or in verse 3, we take it up. We always pray for you. And why he does is because of who they are, God's holy people. We should. We, 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 me, me, me. I could sing of your love forever if I could just keep it in tune and harmony. But we always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard that you trust in Christ Jesus and that you love all of God's people. What an amazing testimony. What an amazing thing we should always do and we should always be. Are we God's holy people because we have love for all of his people. We should be praying for the guy down the street in the church that we call Catholic. We should be praying for the man up on the mountaintop that says he's from the Methodist or the Episcopalian or whatever name it may be that they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. We should be praying for those people that have grace and peace, that have learned that they need Jesus and they have asked Jesus into their life. For anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's not our position to be in charge of the responsibility of being that discerner of who is and isn't of His. But rather because of the love that they have for all God's people, we should bless them. We should pray for them. We should thank them. We should thank God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ for the trust that they have in having love for the brethren. For behold, by this shall you know that you are my disciples indeed, in that you have love for one another. Now we may be of that which gather together and say we love each other, but we should be of those that gather together that say we love each other and we love our brother and sister who may exist in some other place or some other time that we cannot meet with them, but we should consider them to be blessing them. Even as Paul is writing a letter to the Colossians, even as we, as Colossians, should we not write a letter to the Catholic? Should we not write a letter to the Assembly of God? Should we not write a letter to the person down the street that may not be the same as us? If we be Calvary Chapel, should we write to Vineyard? If we be of the Evangelicals, should we write to Rick Warren? Should we write to Greg Laurie? Should we write of the great love we have for the brethren? to all of God's people. Should we not be in love with all of God's people, as it says in Colossians 1.4? You do this. Now, why are they doing this in verse 5? You do this because you are looking forward to the joys of heaven, as you have been ever since you first heard the truth of God's news. I mean, God's good news. 
This same good news that you that came to you is going out to all over the world and it is changing lives everywhere just as it changed yours the very first day you heard and understood the truth about God's great loving kindness to sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For there is no not one who has not sinned. For if we say we have not sinned, we lie and the truth is not in us, for John declares. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For this good news has gone forth to proclaim that we have been imputed the righteousness of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and for the propitiation of all of our sins that we have ever committed, both now and forevermore. Should it not be that the love that covers a multitude of sins goes forth because we have heard the good news? We have discovered and uncovered for ourselves that that which God has done in our lives was meant to be shared throughout the world, that we have gone forth and told to the Muslim, good news for you. God loves you. God forgives you. God wants to save you from your sins, not from your religion, not from your way of thinking. God wants you to know Jesus. He has died for your sins. Good news! Let me tell you, O oh thou who doesn't believe in God, you have the opportunity to know there is a living God. You can find out for yourself that God is alive and Jesus is real. You have been forgiven of everything that you have ever done and every mistake you've ever made. Of all the wrong thinking and the wrong actions, God has made a way that you can be forgiven. The good news has come to you and it is ready to save you from yourself. For you can know the truth and the truth can set you free. And this truth is in Jesus. He wants you to know Him today. The good news has gone forth and changed lives everywhere and every place. It is always demonstrated that it can and does do what we cannot do for ourselves. For it is God that worketh in you both into do and to will of His good pleasure, which is the accomplishment of that act and that work of God that He has given unto us, which is called grace. By His grace we are saved, and by His mercy we have eternal life. So we are given the opportunity to love and to proclaim that good news to the entire generation and the world about us. Will you do that today? Will you be a Colossian today? Will you be a faithful person? Will you be one of those who has been given grace and peace and that you're one of God's holy people who are faithful? Are you a Colossian? Then be just like the Colossians and love all of God's people, as it says in verse 4. So from 5, 6, and 7, we read of all, or 5 and 6, we read of all of that which has gone forth, the good news, the gospel. Are you sharing good news? Are you a bad news bearer? Are you one of those that hibernates at certain times and then comes out and when you're hungry, you eat. When you're thirsty, you drink. But when you need to be about the work of God, you sleep. Are you a bad news bearer? Do you only have things to share that are of the nature of the flesh? That which is consuming of yourself and that which feeds your flesh. Are you one of those kinds of bears? Do you take that time to you know, make sure that you take your nourishment, you take your satisfaction, you take also that opportunity to sleep when you ought to be about the Lord's business working? Are you a bad news bear? Or are you a good news bear? Are you like a cub playing in the sunshine, dancing and prancing and laughing and carrying on? You can have good news, but if you don't share the good news, you may not realize that you are laying up for yourself joys in heaven unspeakable. That even now the reality of how you can express that joy of knowing Jesus, sharing Jesus, comparing the love of God you have in your heart with the joy that you express on your lips, with the peace that passes all understanding to give to those that are mourning, dancing. To be able to see in those that are suffering, life. To be able to lay hands on the sick and recovery. To be able to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and to set at liberty the captives who are held in bondage to drugs, to alcohol, to sex, to lies, to politics, to even violence and their violent nature. You can do with the good news. Are you ready for that kind of joy? Are you ready to be that kind of person? Will you become a Colossian? Will you be one of God's holy people? 
Will you experience that kind of grace and share grace for grace? Do you have that kind of peace? And will you give that peace to others? Epaphras, our much beloved co-brother, verse 7, if you're looking at set verses, Epaphras, our much beloved co-worker, was one who brought to you the good news. He is Jesus' faithful servant and he is helping us in your place. He is the one who told us about the great love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Imagine that. Imagine one of your own in your household being that one that's gone out and bragged about you, that has talked about you, that has proclaimed that you are the one. You have great love and we're going out to tell everyone about it. It's amazing what I saw in my brothers and sisters where I came from. They were of the household of God, even as I myself proclaim to the world right now this great joy I have, this great satisfaction I find in a man of God who has been brought through the same crucible of faith that has crucified his flesh and caused him to go through the agonies of the sufferings of Christ to be brought up into the grace of the Lord Jesus so that he would make manifest at this time when we need it so badly the gospel and the good news he too likewise is sharing the great love he has because of what's been done in his life did he start that way no is he been brought that way yes has he been given that great opportunity my Epaphras I can say to you is Rich Chafin from Calvary Chapel Laguna Creek and there be many others like that. I know of many that, one that's in Arizona that was from Klamath Falls, Oregon. I can't think of his name right now. I think of some others that I have known that over the years have been ministers of God's grace, that have been faithful men and women at different times and places. In my life I have seen and bear witness and tell the truth. They shared the good news. They talked about Jesus. They knew grace and they experienced peace. And they have laid up for themselves the joys of heaven because they're experiencing them here on earth. You can see it in their teaching. You can hear it in their words. You can watch it on their face. They go up. They know. In verse 9, we have continued praying for you ever since we first heard about you. Amazing to be that men ought always to pray and we ought to faint not. We ought to do well the due diligence that we should seek to pray always, considering one another for love. To be able to say to God, God, how often have I prayed? And God says, look, I have written down and recorded in this book, this book of remembrance, every time you spoke, every time you took the time, every time you chose to spend your life in intercession for another or praying and asking for another or talking to me in secret for another I have recorded for behold this is the book of remembrance that shall be for eternity and the angels shall read for they have recorded it as such and I think of that and I think wow then if God records these things should we not be doing these things if these are scrolls in heaven that are a Bible of remembrance a book that shall be in existence in the heavenlies. Should we not be more about what we should do about? Should we be about the Lord's business as he is said to pray always? And he said, pray in secret as your heavenly Father sees in secret and would reward you openly. If we have not been so rewarded by the answer to our prayers, then perhaps it's because we haven't spent the time in conversation to expect that God would meet our prayers. Perhaps we need to ask and receive. Perhaps be still and listen, then pray and petition. Perhaps it is of that nature, once we do receive the answers and see that God is real, that we would ask Jesus to be as real as we are speaking you and I, so that we would get and receive conversation as well as confirmation by God doing as he said he would. For he hears our prayers and he meets our needs. We ask God to give you a complete understanding of what he wants to do in your lives. And we ask him to make you wise with spiritual wisdom. In verse 9 we are told that they could have 
as Paul is praying for them, that which is declared in James 1.5, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. And yet Paul is praying that they would be wise with spiritual wisdom. He is praying that they would be able to see the things of the Spirit, not on the outward manifestation of the action, but the inward realization of the Spirit working in a person's life. For the good news is that which goes out to change those things that are corruptible, making them incorruptible. The good news is to take that which is like dogs and make them into people. To take those which snap and bite and yell and scream and fight and have violence in their nature to make them full of love and of peace, to experience joy and to know completeness in Jesus. Is that not that with which spiritual wisdom comes from within? That the Spirit of God could make it happen in our life? That we should be able to experience the love, the peace, and the joy of the Lord? We ask Him of what He wants that He may give to you a complete understanding of what He wants to do in your lives. For how many times would we pray that we want something for their life? Did a person discover on their own what does God want in their life? I pray the Lord would give you that same prayer right now. That you would stop what you're doing and let's stop what we're doing. And let's pray that prayer together, shall we? Oh God, we ask you to give us a complete understanding of what you want to do in our lives. Amen. In Jesus' name. Would you pray that with me again? I know you probably faked it, but I mean it. It's that simple, so now that you know what it is, pray with me. Oh God, we ask you to give us a complete understanding of what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. My prayer for you is that you have meant that and that you would come to a realization of what God wants for you in your life. He wants you to have eternal life. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life, but he who has not the Son of God has not life. God wants you to know Jesus. God wants you to hear Jesus. God wants you to follow Jesus. When they came to the mountaintop, James, John, and Peter saw Jesus revealed for the first time. They knew He had said He was the Son of God. They knew that He had said He was the Messiah, the Anointed One. They knew that they had said that He was sent by His Father. But they did not know He was God. And when they came to the mountaintop, they saw Him revealed. We call it the transfiguration. They saw him in his glory, speaking with Moses and Elijah. And as Peter saw that, he was amazed and moved to such a place that he fell on his face and wanted to worship and to offer up some kind of sacrifice. He couldn't stand being in the presence of such holiness. It was driving him crazy. It was driving him beyond his means to be still and know God. He had to do something. And so he said, let us make tabernacles. Let us worship here you. Let us offer worship up in your name or worship you and Moses and Elijah as presence of your personages. And a cloud came and God the Father spoke. This is my beloved Son in whom I will please listen to him. That is what God wants for you. As you have prayed, so may it be that God will speak to you, our Father, and tell you, listen to Jesus. May that be the answer to your prayer that you just heard from the Spirit of God. Listen to Jesus. Follow Him. In verse 10 we're told, Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and you will continually do good, kind things for others. All the while you will learn how to know God better and better because you will know God better and better because you will listen to Jesus. You will follow Jesus. You will know Jesus. Because the way you live will be following Jesus. Jesus said, come and follow me. Would you do that today? 
Would you come unto Jesus and learn His way? He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I have a way, a more excellent way than your violent way. You go out and kill in the name of God. You destroy and maim and argue and fight. And you say you're doing what is right. And you act as though you weren't operating in darkness when you say you have soft targets. When you say that you are killing because God has said you are righteous and this is a holy war. I have a more excellent way. I have a better way. I have the way of grace to give unmerited favor to your enemies, to change the heart of your foe, to make that person that you think will kill you bless you. For I can turn them from darkness to light. I can change what is crooked and make it right. I can make a straight way for those to walk in the path that I have chosen the way because I am the truth and the light. You will continually do good, kind things for others because you will know God and God will work in you, both to do and to will of His good pleasure. For it is God who can accomplish these things of you, in you, by you, and through His Spirit. Would you not ask God to do that in your life right now? Whether you're in the police force, or you're in the army, or you're in the navy, the marines, the coast guard, whatever it may be, God can keep you from direct confrontations of killing or being killed. He can arrange the circumstances by His providential will, by providence itself, by circumstances He directs. Because the object of your objections is always who really is in control. Because when you think you need to kill and do those things contrary to when Jesus said, love your enemies, you are out of control of the will of God and in control of the will of man. And you are deceived by the spirit of this world that says you must become violent to protect yourself. Because God can't do it for you. God will not protect you if you don't protect yourself. God will not operate if you choose to be still and see the salvation he brings. And the lie goes forth. But you can know the truth. You can be in that place of peace. You can experience the grace of God in your life. You can ask God to protect you. You can ask God to direct you. You can ask God to live in you. You can ask Jesus to be so real that he would whisper in your ear when there is trouble near. That he could give you a way of escape that you'd be able to bear. For there has no temptation taken you, nor trial, nor tribulation, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you'd be able to bear it. For his way of escape is to find in the realization of his will you being directed by God. God will direct you. God will save you. God will be your Savior, your Redeemer, your salvation. For that is what His name means. He is our salvation. We also pray that you will be strengthened with His glorious power so that you will have all the patience and endurance you need. Oh, wow. Oh my, oh how powerful a thing to pray for anyone in this day to have the power of what? Patience. Do you have the power of patience? Are you able to wait on the Lord? Are you able to be still and see the salvation He will bring? Can you wait a day? Can you wait a week? Can you wait a month? Can you wait a year? Are you 40 years in the desert? Are you 400 years in Babylon? Can you wait one election? Can you wait one selection? Can you wait one cycle of presidencies or two? Can you object, detect, reject the hasty spirit that has gone out into the world that is causing you to run and run and run and run and run. Not just run in jogging, or run in your job, or run to work, or run to live your life, or run in your hamster circle, but run your mouth, run your emotions, run your monies, run your time, 
run your energies to the extent that you burn out what God would have given out to you in patience and peace. Do you have the power of patience? For we see that in the power of patience, the man who will wait on the Lord will endure trial and tribulation. But the man who runs forward fast and hasty will fall into the pit and bring many with him. He will cause sudden destruction to come upon them, for they shall reap to the they shall sow to the wind and reap of the whirlwind destruction. But the man that has the power of patience can wait on the Lord. And when he says go, that man will do. Do you have that power? For the Holy Spirit wants to give you patience. You have need of patience in that after you have done the will of God, you might inherit the promise, we are told, in James. I believe it's James. We are told that let patience have its perfect work, that the man of God might be fully equipped, fully matured, fully developed. Do you have the power of patience? Are you a man of God or a child of God? If you put a child still and ask them to stand still or be still, they can't. They have to move. They have to be about. They have to act as though there were such a thing as attention deficit disorder or dysfunctions of some type of reality that we try to call some name upon it so that we can put it into a box and categorize it for something that it's not. We call it that. We choose to use it as that, but that's not what it is. In reality, it's the, un the incapability of the realization of knowing God's ability. And so we categorize and we leave things to the failure of our own ability to adapt, to inherit, to appreciate, and to give to God that which may be our strength that we might call ADD, ADHD, Crohn's disease, or any other affliction that may have come upon us that God has not removed. Or, better yet, if God has given it to us and that's for our blessing, that's one thing for the power of patience to give us that perfect patience to endure. Or, we have not exercised the faith to simply believe that God could take it away at any point in time and heal us. For by His stripes, we are healed. So we have many excuses for not being patient. But do you have and do you want the power of patience? Do you want the power to endure? For patience is not endurance. Endurance is that capability of strength being exercised to its maximum. We talk about so many times of people getting into physical shape, but we don't talk about their spiritual shape. Are you patient? That is spiritual exercise. Are you enduring unto blood even, resisting the devil or resisting sin unto blood, which is endurance. Are you enduring as that? Have you developed those spiritual exercises in your life to become that kind of muscle-bound spiritual being? Or are you floundering in the flab of which you are? Father, I pray that you would give us this power of patience. I pray that those that are listening right now would discover, first of all, patience. And then discover the Holy Spirit, which is wanting to give to everyone this ability and capability that needs to be developed in our lives as fruit. That is, patience. And so, God, I also pray that for the endurance, you would cause us by the circumstances and by your training ground to be enduring as we are found in this prayer, to be needful of that with which you could give us. As Paul has prayed for the Colossians, we pray to you that you would give it unto us and we would be patient and endure. In Jesus' name, amen. And you know, when you think about that, you look at it and you say, may you be filled with joy in, verse, in the rest of that verse. We also pray that you will be strengthened with this glorious power so you will have all the patience and endurance you need and may you be filled with joy. Count it all joy, James says, my brethren, when you fall into divers trials and tribulations, knowing that the working of your faith produces patience. Have you worked your faith? Or are you just claiming it? Have you exercised your faith? Or are you just naming it? Have you actually practiced your faith or are you just pretending that God doesn't work that way anymore because you have no faith? Don't tell me what God cannot do when the Word of God declares me what He will do. 
if you choose to live according to faith. For it is by faith you are saved. It is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the accomplishing of His work, but it is also by faith in God that you could say to this mountain, Be thou removed. You could heal as God has told you to. You could hear as God has said you could. You could see as God has said you must. And you could know as God has said you should. For you see, in this Colossian letter, we are finding that we need to pray more and accept the fact of we believe less than what God has said we really do. We need more of Him and less of ourselves. We need less of the excuse and more of the use. You see, faith is easy to excuse, but it's a hard thing to use. Because until you stepped out in faith and walked on water, until you stepped out in faith and laid hands on the sick and they've healed, until you've resurrected the dead, until you have been as one that is dead and have been raised from the dead, then you really don't know what faith is, do you? You think you do until you pray and nothing happens. Then do you have faith or has your faith fled? Because you dread praying now for those who are dead or those who are dying or those who are sick or those who are living. You have no faith to trust in the Lord for His will to be done. I got good news for you. It's not worried about your faith. I got joyful news for you. It's not about your ability of faith. I got an exciting truth to share with you about faith and what you can't do and what you have said God doesn't do. I've got something that's so exciting and so wonderful and so powerful that it's going to blow your mind. It's going to change you and rearrange you into the way that God wants you to enjoy and be full of joy. It's in verse 12. Always thanking the Father who has enabled you to share the inheritance that belongs to God's holy people who live in the light. Your inheritance is to be Jesus Christ. Your inheritance is to walk in the light. Your inheritance is to heal the sick, raise the dead, to freely receive and freely give. Your inheritance is in and already has been waiting for you to use and be recipient of Jesus as he has given it to us because you are one of God's holy people. And because you're God's holy people and you've been given grace, because you're one of God's holy people and you've been given peace, you can give what you have got. But you've got to go to God to get what you need. Because if you don't have faith to believe, then you have to ask God, do it for me. I don't believe I can heal. Then God, you heal them. I don't believe that person could be raised from the dead. Then in the name of Jesus Christ, you rise from the dead. I don't believe that God could heal me of my own disease. Then God, you heal me, for I cannot believe. Help thou my unbelief. God can, for you have an inheritance. By that with which Jesus has laid to bear all the principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in this world, nailing them to the cross, he has not stopped them from operating yet. But they have been rendered defenseless to who he is. For they have been removed from the curse that your life is. And you have been made the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Your inheritance is to be appropriate to that place God wants you to be, recognizing one day by this great joyful declaration, you are a son of God. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Because when I see you, I see Jesus in you. And because I see Jesus in you, I don't just love you, I adore you. That is your inheritance. You have a Father now, today, who is for you. You have Jesus today, your inheritance. The earnest of His Spirit has been placed inside you. That is your declaration to the world that God is with you, that God is for you, that God has put inside of you His Spirit so that nothing can overcome you 
and never will you ever be separated from God again. And we thank God for that, for doing it for us because we had nothing to do about it. It was not of our own actions that made us to reflect upon or become that with which we could inherit anything. It is an inheritance with which we did not know was coming. And yet now we are told we have. Just like the will that is read, the word has been said, and now you have it. It is yours. It is your inheritance. You are God's holy people. You are the faithful one. For he has rescued us. He, Jesus, has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness. And he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. For God has purchased our freedom with his blood and forgiven all our sins. Isn't that really what the atonement is? We see that in verse 13 and in 14 and the accomplishment of it in 15. Because the reality of that, he has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness is Satan himself of the God of this world. And you were once in darkness, but now you've been brought to the light. Walk in the light as he is in the light. For he has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. As he is in the light, let us walk in the light, for he is the light of the world, and we are that light which is shining forth into the darkness. For where we are, we are the light. God has purchased our freedom with his blood and he has forgiven all our sins. We are free from the ruler of this world and he has nothing in us, nothing on us, and nothing to hold us. He can do nothing to us for we are free from the ruler of this world, from the kingdom of this evil age we live in, from the things of the world and the world and its ways. We have been made free by his blood and he has forgiven all our sins. And so as we look at Colossians and we end it there, we're going to stop for a minute and realize whom the Son has set free, he is free indeed. And that freedom that we've been given is not the freedom to go and do according to our will be done, but the freedom that we've been given is that opportunity to lay down our life before God that he may take it up and give it to his son. For we are his inheritance as we have his inheritance. He gave up his godliness for our sinfulness. And we have inherited his godliness that we might lay down our godful ways so that he may receive the glory for all the things we do in our days. It is to God be the glory great things he has done by the atonement of his son. So to God our Father be the glory forever and ever and honor and praise be unto him for that with which he has accomplished for us as Colossians is to make us, to change us, to arrange us and to call us faithful because of the love he has for us. And because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, you have been given that opportunity to know the son and the son has set you free. And when the Son has set you free, whoever you may be, you are free indeed. And it's because of this great love that God has for you that you can know that you have an inheritance in heaven that is beyond rust, beyond corruption, beyond thieves breaking in and stealing. You have more for you than you ever imagined because God wants to do for you all that you could possibly think or consider in this life. He wants to be more than your wife. He wants to be more than your husband. He wants to be more than your children. He wants to be your God. And He wants to be your Savior. And He wants to be your Lord. And He wants to be your friend. And He wants you more than that to have something beyond your imagination. He wants you to be one with God. Yeah, one with the Father. One with the Son one with the Spirit. He wants you a holy people. You're chosen. You are. You have been grafted in. You have been 
kept by the power of the Holy Spirit and you are being perfected by God the Spirit, God the Son, and the Father's will to make you into the image of Jesus himself. That Jesus in you, the hope of glory, is greater than that which is in the world, Satan. And that because God is in you, because God is with you, because God is for you and God lives inside you, what can't you do? What more could you enjoy or employ than that with which God has given you? Eternal life and His Spirit. And if His Spirit be within you and you are the light, then you can walk in the light. You can know the truth. You can see that which you ought to be. And you can be that. Because God has said, I have an inheritance for you. Take now what you need. Receive from me and I will give to you. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Oh, knock, and I'll open the door for you. And I will let you in. And you will always be accepted in my sight. For I am the Lord your God, maker of heaven and earth. Declare unto me what you need, and I will be your provider. Declare unto me what you have possession of, or dispossessed of your peace, and I will give you peace, for I am the Prince of Peace, and I have given you grace and mercy that you should receive my peace. Peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. My peace I give unto you. And so the Spirit of God gives you peace. But more than that, God says, I love you. I so loved you, I give you my Son, and you've accepted my Son. That means I, the Father, love you. Receive my love. Be filled. Blown upon. Breathed upon. Breathed upon. Spoken upon. That with which God has given you. An anointing from the God of our Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's anointing is upon you. You are chosen. You are faithful. You are the one, brother and sister, that God died for. That God gave His love for. That God loves you. And will always love you. So go for His love to all the brethren everywhere. The brothers and sisters that you don't know, the ones yet to unfold before you as He reveals to you whom He loves, whom He has given His life for, whom He has said to you, go tell the good news that you've received. The great graciousness of God by His loving kindness and His grace and mercy He has reached out to save the world with because His Son has died. And because He died for you and you live for Him, you can share the good news and declare to the entire world the great mercy of God and the inheritance you have, the great joy that you experience because you know, you know, you know, <laughs> more than you ever imagined, you really do know inside. God has got so much more for you to enjoy in this life and more of the entire inheritance of Jesus Christ in heaven. That you can take a crown and you can lay it down at the feet of the cross. But you can take that crown and you can lay it down now at the feet of Jesus. And you can take up your cross and follow Him all the days of your life and serve the Lord Jesus Christ with joy unspeakable, with love divine, with a peace that goes so beyond all understanding that people will wonder about you and say, ha! He's one of those Christians, I can tell. There ain't nothing shaking him up. He's shaking and baking and enjoying the goodness of our God. Because even though in the world you have tribulation, you have cheer, you have joy, because Jesus has overcome the world. Oh my God, my Father, the Lord Jesus, I pray, may you intercede on our behalf as you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Make intercession for all of these that hear my voice, that you can see that need you, that want you, that desire you. Bless them. Encourage them. Give them the gift of joy. Give them the greatness of your peace. Give them the satisfaction of loving the world and its ways in one way that God so loved it that He gave His Son for it. Not with what the world is doing, but what God has created to it be accomplished. That you would be having a platform with which to demonstrate the Father's love. And that is what this world was. A demonstration of what God could do for all of eternity in showing what He is. Love. And so God, I pray, 
as Jesus intercedes on our behalf, hear Him. Listen to Him. Let Him and let you decide to abide with us. For we are meek. We are weak. We are humble. We are learning patience. We are seeking to endure. We are wanting to be holy. We surely are not as we ought to be. But God, you love me and you forgive me. And God, you have forgiven me and you have accepted me because you have taken that which your son has done and allowed me to inherit that righteousness that you gave to him for the sacrifice he made for me. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. And so I pray for you. May God bless you today as you study in His Word, as you walk in His way, as you learn of Jesus, as you walk out today, knowing you laid down your life to Him again, so that He can take up your life and blow life upon it. So you laid down your burden so He could say, Gone. So He could speak peace unto you and say to you, Peace, be still. And you can go forth in joy of the Lord, knowing that God is with you, that God has accomplished His purpose to you, that God has given you life eternal and now you have life in this life that you can go forward enjoying that life that he's given you that eternity has begun for you today and it goes on forever and ever and ever and that just a bump in the road is the death that may come one day in your way or that rapture that may come in the way that you see it coming soon because surely God is going to say to you come up here come up hither rejoice and dance with me come Enjoy the feast I prepared for you, a banqueting table in the midst of your enemies, for you have loved the brethren. You have loved those I have chosen to die for. Come, and let us seek to come unto the Lord Jesus. And do not leave today, or go where you are, or be where you are today, tonight, this day, without getting right, without getting blessed, without getting rest from my Father, because if you don't know Jesus, I do pray you do. If you don't know God, I do pray you do. If you don't hear from God, I do pray you do. But I do pray you get rest. You get peace. You get grace for your needs today. You go forward and find in your way that God is working to bring you to himself. And that if you're going through it, you don't have to. If you're really toughing it out, you don't have to be about being beat upon, but that you can cast your life upon the open arms of God and He can wrap you up in His, and He can love on you, and He can bless you, and He can breathe life into your worthless soul and you can be born again and made whole. Because without being of His Spirit, you have no life. You're just existing and you're a zombie walking dead and that you're just waiting for the eternity to come then you'll exist in the lake of fire. But that's not what God intended. He intended for you to be full of joy, to be like that expression of the joy of the Spirit that danced and created and sang in the moment that creation exploded into light. When God said, let there be light, there was an explosion. And when God said to your sperm and your ovum, life, you exploded and became a living soul. And in that moment, you didn't know it, but God had written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. It is for you to find your inheritance. I pray you know that now. And that you go forward today knowing, loving, and experiencing Jesus in a way you never dreamed imaginable. That today you be the Colossian. Today you go forward faithful and true. Today you have the endurance. Today you have the patience. And today, you be with Jesus. Amen? Amen. And God bless you. God keep you. God caused so much more so to you than you ever dreamed that He could possibly do, whether you dance, whether you sing, whether you cry, whether you weep, whether you mourn, whether you suffer, whether you are laughing, whether you are crying. God be with you. God is for you. But I pray my Lord Jesus always heal you, 
hear you, help you, and reveal himself to you.